Appointment in Crime Alley puts emphasis on Batman's personality and genesis in a way most episodes don't. In most stories, we see Batman through the lens of being a superhero or a detective, or at least as a competent professional. This story keeps that, but Batman exhibits a greater variety of emotions because the situation he is put in is of a more personal nature. But it's never taken too far by showing Batman having an emotional outburst, which would be out of character. The plot this time around makes things per more personal for Batman because Roland Daggett is trying to destroy the part of Gotham called Park Row for his own uses. Most Batman fans know that Park Row was the most luxurious place in Gotham and that it later became the slum known as Crime Alley, but this episode explains this for newcomers and it's how I first learned about the significance of Crime Alley. What really connects Batman to this place is the death of his parents, which makes him feel he must keep fighting crime so that Crime Alley will never ruin another child's life. This is not the only reason Batman wants Crime Alley preserved, but we'll get into more of it as we go along. Taggart has his assistant Crocker and an arson expert named Nitro rig Crime Alley to explode at 9 o'clock, which adds the story device to the ticking time bomb because as the episode progresses, the audience will be shown what time it is and that the clock hands are always getting closer and closer to 9. Part of what makes this exciting is that while Batman does initially suspect Taggart is up to something, he at first has no idea that he's on the clock. This story has a plausible reason for Batman to go to Crime Alley and essentially bump into this plot, because every year he goes to Crime Alley to visit Leslie Tompkins on the anniversary of his parents' death, which explains the title of the episode. It's important to note that this episode is loosely based on Detective Comics issue 457 by Dennis O'Neill and Dick Giordano called There is No Hope in Crime Alley. It goes to show how influential Dennis O'Neill is to the formation of the modern-day Batman. In the comic, there is no giant plot by Roland Daggett or anyone else, just Batman visiting Crime Alley and fighting the seemingly endless amount of criminals in it for the anniversary of his parents' death and essentially the birth of Batman. One of the major things the episode keeps from the comic is the character of Leslie Tompkins and how she was the one that comforted young Bruce Wayne on that terrible night. In modern Batman comics, Leslie Tompkins has become one of the main parts of Batman's supporting cast, which carries over to Batman the Animated Series, though she doesn't appear in too many episodes. What's interesting is that in the original comic, Leslie does not know who Batman really is. I'm not too clear on when she found out in the comics, since nowadays she obviously knows, but from her first appearance in Batman the Animated Series, she already does, which is never explicitly stated within the episode, but later episodes such as Blind as a Bat make it perfectly clear. This episode does let the audience know through images, especially in the newspaper, that Leslie is a doctor, but otherwise we wouldn't know because she spends most of the episode tied up. Later episodes make use of her skills as a doctor, which is good, and it is fine that it's not focused on this time around because it isn't necessary. While Roland Dagg is the main antagonist, Crime Alley itself is almost above him because most of the episode is Batman constantly being forced to put a search for Leslie aside to stop problems within Crime Alley. The first problem is that a little girl tells Batman to help her mom, who is being roughed up by men who work for Daggett, who want her to clear out of her home because of what will happen at 9 o'clock. Next, Batman runs into a man atop a billboard with a gun holding a hostage because the city made him lose his job and home. I'm constantly surprised how mature Batman the Animated Series can be because this situation feels very realistic and though a SWAT team was there to stop the man, I shudder to think what would have happened if Batman hadn't intervened and saved the day. After going to Leslie's house, Batman interrogates a bum who saw Leslie get grabbed by Crocker and Nitro. As Batman goes to save Leslie, Crime Alley throws yet another obstacle at Batman when a trolley conductor is unconscious and the trolley is running out of control through the city. One of my favorite moments in the episode is when Batman sees the trolley causing all that chaos and he very frustratedly says, Perfect. Just perfect. I love how Kevin Conroy delivered that line. Usually it's kind of unlikable when a character just complains out loud, but Batman doesn't talk so much, so when he does, he has something to say. That simple line shows the audience that Crime Alley is starting to get to him. Uh, Batman stops the trolley and finds Crocker and Nitro. The scene where Batman interrogates them is really cool. Come to think of it, any scene of Batman interrogating someone with Kevin Conroy's voice makes me happy, so it's no wonder that I love the game Arkham City. As Batman unties Leslie, the episode builds up to the moment where the clock reaches 9, with the speech Roland Daggett makes at the Better Business Council dinner. In a way, he does have a point in that part of the reason the city can't make progress in terms of keeping crime down is Crime Alley, but he would only make it worse by controlling more criminal operations, and the good people of Crime Alley would be driven out of their homes. The episode catches the audience off guard by showing many Crime Alley buildings explode at 9, but Batman goes to Dagon and explains that he was able to disarm the bombs, except for a few abandoned buildings. Dagon is able to weasel his way out of suspicion by placing the blame entirely on Crocker and Nitro. 
In the original Detective Comics issue, there is a moment where Batman loses his temper and brutally beats up a thug who pulls a gun on him the same place his parents died. At the end of this episode, Batman has a similar moment where we see him angrier than we've ever seen before, when Daggett leaves Scott free, but like in the original comic, Leslie calms him down. This moment shows that Batman can't always win, and the point that Batman gets angry feels more natural than Batman having a blowout on a thug who has a gun. No offense to the original comic, which is also very good, but I prefer how it's handled in this episode. The episode ends with Batman and Leslie finally having their appointment in Crime Alley, with Batman leaving roses in the spot where his parents were killed, and closes with the image from the newspaper Batman looked at earlier with Leslie Tompkins comforting Bruce Wayne when he was a boy. On the whole, I think I Am The Knight did a better job exploring Batman's humanity, but the way this episode did was very effective as well, and the final image is truly heartwarming. The last line Batman has in the episode is that there are still good people in Crime Alley. It's a difficult line to walk to make Gotham such a horrible place, but also make it worth saving. Most popular Batman stories are able to make this work, including Year One and Batman Begins, by making it clear that Batman um, sees that Gotham City genuinely has good people in it. This is why the comic City of Crime really rubs me the wrong way. It makes practically every citizen of Gotham seem like scum, and it doesn't help when Batman himself is not all that likable. I know I didn't need to mention the City of Crime comic, but it goes to show that it's difficult to balance the evil and good within the city. Appointment in Crime Alley is a very well done story, and it surprises me thinking back when I watched this episode as a kid that I still really enjoyed it because there are no supervillains, just regular people and Batman helping them out, which is definitely a plus. I mentioned before what Mark Waid said about the best episodes of the series being about human emotions, but this episode also embodies this extremely well. The animation is quite good this time. How the action sequences move is not particularly impressive, but most things are very well drawn. There are certain parts where Batman is abnormally muscular, but it also looks really good. There are moments where Batman is in shadow, and the blue highlights on Batman's costume really stands out in the dark background. This definitely makes for some very cool looking screenshots. Another plus of the animation is the Batmobile, which we see plenty of, especially in the trolley scene. Vehicles are more difficult to animate well in cell animation, according to Bruce Timm, so it's impressive that the Batmobile always retained its shape, even when it was speeding through the road. The physics of the Batmobile stopping something as heavy as a trolley looked realistic as well, especially with the very cool reverse thrusters. The music very effectively sets the more personal tone the story was going for. There is a theme that repeats many times throughout the episode that has that personal feeling, but it sounds intense, which fits the ticking time bomb plot point, giving the audience the sense that time is constantly running out. The score also gets very touching and sentimental, especially at the end when Batman leaves the roses. The two main guest stars in this episode are Ed Asner as Roland Daggett and Diane Mulder as Leslie Tompkins. I've already said that Ed Asner is a superb voice actor, but I feel the need to say it again because he's that good. I probably wouldn't care much for Daggett as a character if his voice didn't sound so good, so I look forward to him popping up despite the fact that he's just a regular corrupt businessman. Fans of Star Trek might know Diane Mulder as Dr. Pulaski from The Next Generation. Much like Alfred and Gordon, she brought warmth to her role, which makes the idea that Tompkins is Bruce's surrogate mother work very well. Her performance also gave the character dignity, so you feel that she means it when she says that Crime Alley is her home and that she's not afraid. I've already said how good a job Kevin Conroy did, so I think I'll leave it at that for the voice acting. If you have the first box set, Appointment in Crime Alley is one of the episodes I recommend most. It's a great introduction to Batman's relationship with the citizens of Gotham, though part of your enjoyment of the episode may have to do more with whether you enjoy Batman's stories where he goes up against a supervillain. Still, I commend Batman the Animated Series for telling a good variety of stories, because Batman is a character that can be used for different types of narratives, which is part of the reason he has lasted throughout the years. This episode is relatively straightforward, and sometimes the best way to convey a story is to keep things simple. Not every episode can do that in a way that's very enjoyable, but Appointment in Crime Alley does, so I rate it a 5 out of 5. Despite giving it a perfect score, I do understand why I don't see this episode on many top 10 lists, because this series has many other great episodes. In terms of the first box set, it's one of the best episodes on there. Thanks as always for tuning in, and next time we are introduced to another Batman villain in Mad as a Hatter. Hope you guys will join me for that next review, so until then, take care.